all. We're an interdisciplinary team of lawyers, planners, policy analysts, and other health professionals who collaborate with community organizations, local and state governments, and anchor institutions to create thriving, just communities. Our priority is helping communities who are at risk for the high, who are at the highest risk for poor health. Our strength at Change Lab Solutions lies in using the tools of law and policy in a collaborative and cross-sectoral way to ensure that policy solutions are both practical for government systems and institutions and meaningful for the people they are meant to help. Change Lab also works with change makers to improve their knowledge and capacity to use law and policy to change systems, policies, and practices to advance health equity. Again, thank you for joining us today. And before we dive into the conversation, there's just a couple logistical issues to cover. Next slide. First, this event is going to be recorded and it will be posted on Change Lab Solutions website within the next week. And you should also receive a follow-up email with the link to the recording once it's ready. The chat function is open, as you can see. I already see a lot of um, greetings and well wishes from folks. And we encourage you to share any reactions and engage with each other. If you have questions that you'd like to specifically dedicate to the speakers, please use the Q&A function. And if you'd like to join us in live tweeting during the event, we invite you to use hashtag uprooting inequity. Next slide. I also want to let everyone know that a live transcript option is available for today's session. And in your Zoom window, you should see a button that says live transcript pictured here on the slide. If you click on that, you have the option to either show or hide subtitles. And you can also adjust the font size to your preferences under subtitle settings. Our colleague Bernard Lim, <clears throat> excuse me, is here to help ensure that all of our tech runs smoothly. So if you run into any issues, please send him a direct note via Zoom. Next slide. So this is the kickoff series to a, a series of webinars that are going to look at the five drivers that we'll talk about today. And they're gonna be looking at them through a specific topic area. Each of the sessions will feature a practitioner or a community member or a funder or advocate who will share their concrete actions, policies, and resources to help improve health inequities or to help improve health equity. Next slide. So I'm really thrilled to have our panelists here today who have a distinguished history of working on health equity and serving as an advocate for those communities who are really the most underserved and often experience structural discrimination at, at much more higher rates. Dr. Aksiris Barbo is an adjunct assistant professor at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health and senior fellow for public health and social justice at the JPB Foundation. Dr. Barbo has a history and has been at the center of public health, health equity, and healthcare delivery. She's previously held positions as the Health Commissioner of New York City and of Baltimore City, where she helped introduce the health and all policies approach. She is a recognized leader in local government as well as nonprofit leadership, and we're really proud that Dr. Barbo serves on our board of directors here at Change Lab Solutions. Dr. Kara James is the president and CEO of Grantmakers in Health. And before joining GIH in 2020, she was the director of the Office of Minority Health at the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. And under her guidance there, CMS developed an equity plan to improve quality and Medicare, which is a fantastic plan, I've reviewed it, and also the rural health strategy. She was previously employed and worked with the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation and also at Harvard University. And Wendelie Marte is the Director of Economic Justice at the Center for Community Change, where she has been fighting for economic justice, education reform, and progressive political engagement for over 14 years. Before joining the center, she coordinated local, state, and federal campaigns with the goal of building political power for young people, immigrants, and low-income communities of color in the Bronx and beyond. She's committed to building a progressive political movement in New York City that is founded on the principles of economic democracy and that places the value of people over capital. Well, now that you've had a chance to get to know us a little bit, we'd like to get to know you in the audience as well. So um, next slide. Before we dive into the discussion, we wanna do a quick poll. So if you, um, Bernard, if you wanna launch the poll, and we'd love to get a sense of who is the primary audience that you're serving through your work. 
So if you want to take a moment, we will, um, if you could go ahead and, and vote and we can, we'll see what the poll is and get a sense of who it is that you are primarily working with. We'll give it about 30 seconds or so. So if there's specific communities you work with, go ahead and um, note that. But if you work more broadly, you can also note that. So if the poll comes up, if you can click that poll, that would be great. Otherwise, you can also introduce it into the chat where we have the other functions. Great, so I see a couple of names coming in. Lots of local health, also some education, diabetes folks, that's great. Elected officials, rural government, amazing. All right, so we can go ahead and close the poll, Bernard. So lots of more general kind of public as opposed to very specific audiences, but we've got a few there also working with low income communities. Great. Okay, we'll do one more just to get a sense of what are the primary issue areas that you're focusing on. So if we can go to the next slide, Bernard, and then if you don't mind, launching the poll. So this is just to get a sense of if there's a primary area that you're focused on. We'll give it a couple of seconds. It's great, a quite a wide range of different issues. Um, some very specific, some more broad. Great. Okay, so Bernard, if you want to close this poll, we'll kind of get a sense of that, and uh, we can you can scroll through the chat to also just get a sense of the the wide range of different issues. Public health broadly, some food healthcare issues, quite a bit of other. All right. Thank you for sharing that. We really appreciate it, and you can continue to enter some of those in as well. Next slide. So just to orient ourselves today, I wanted to um, spend just a few minutes sharing some definitions and frameworks just to help us kind of frame the discussion because sometimes we tend to use terms like health disparity and health inequity quite interchangeably. And so I wanted to take a moment to clarify how we at Change Lab think of these things, again, just as we're starting to define and um, come into conversation today. There are a lot of different definitions of health inequities, but today I'm gonna to use the one from the National Academies of Sciences. And they define health equity as the state in which everyone has the opportunity to attain full health potential. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or any other socially defined circumstance. And an influential researcher on social inequality added a moral dimension to the concept of equity and inequity. And she, this was Margaret Whitehead, and she defined inequities as the differences in health that are not only unnecessary and avoidable, but in addition are unjust and unfair. So we at Change Lab, when we talk about health inequities, we are explicitly talking about those differences that are avoidable as well as unfair and unjust. Next slide, please. And this image that we like to use, the image that it's gonna be coming right up, it really shows the difference between equality and equity. And so this is a good just kind of um, demonstration of that. So um, Bernard, if you could advance the slide for me. So the image at the top, it has an illustration of, an, of, an, of a type of intervention that is kind of a, one that's focused on equality. And that would mean that it's a one size fits all solution. So here you're, we're giving individuals the same bike. It's a bike, which is great, but it's the same bike. And so it's not necessarily fitting everybody's needs. 
it's great for the two people in the middle, but for the person in the it, that's in the wheelchair or the younger person who's a little smaller, this kind of size bike doesn't necessarily fit the, what they need. So it just goes to show that even though there may be an equal approach um, and it's well-intentioned, it's not necessarily going to benefit everyone equally. So the second illustration is the equity approach. And on that hand, that's when we're ensuring that people have what they need in order to thrive. And it also re acknowledges the reality that not everyone is starting off in the same place. What one person or even population might need is different from what another needs. And so when we fail to design interventions with equity in mind, we can see that the, there's the potential, even where it's well-intentioned, to not only maintain inequities, but in some cases to widen them. So here, providing the bike to everyone that's the same, it would allow those two individuals in the middle to just take off while the other two are left far behind. Before COVID-19, health inequities were already entrenched and growing, and COVID-19 has only demonstrated to everyone just how, how those inequities are really affecting people's lives. And so these factors that impede health, such as discrimination and poverty and disenfranchisement, they're really embedded in our systems and policies and laws. And those are the things that often shape our physical, economic, and social environments. And those are what have led to the proliferation of health inequities over many generations. And so our present day gaps in health and prosperity, they're actually rooted in historical injustice and systemic inequities. But we're now starting to see more and more individuals and advocates and funders and governments who are starting to recognize the existence of these inequities and the need to reverse them through structural change. Next slide, please. At Change Lab Solutions, we believe that one of the most powerful risk factors in health are unjust laws and policies, those that have perpetuated racism, discrimination, and segregation through our nation's history. And yet, laws and policies are also powerful tools for change. And this is because, one, they have the power to undo historical harms, two, they affect large groups of people, and three, they're engaging people. They engage the change makers themselves. So in 2019, Change Lab released our blueprint for change makers, and that proposes that achieving health equity requires addressing the structural barriers to health. We call them the fundamental drivers of health inequities. And this includes structural discrimination and racism, income inequality and poverty, disparities in opportunity, disparities in political power, and governance that limits meaningful participation. So we believe that using tools of law and policy, we can help to undo those fundamental drivers of inequity and thereby increase health equity. So I'm not going to define all of them. And, and the next series of webinars, we will get into various different aspects of the drivers. But I want to touch on one of them, which is taking a moment to describe structural discrimination. So the way in which we describe it in, our, in the blueprint is that it refers to discrimination against a historically oppressed group of people that is built into how systems and, oper and systems and institutions operate. So it's about the systemic injustices. It's not necessarily the individual acts of discrimination or bigotry. And so examples of this include redlining, defunding schools, and policing tactics that target homeless and poor people or people of color. So we created the blueprint for changemakers as a guide for all of us to help start the discussions, to build on our partnerships, and to really start to offer this and to offer tools to be able to shift power and resources to improve health. So before we dive into discussion, just one last poll, um, so we can go to the next slide. And um, go ahead and launch the poll too, Bernard, because what we want to hear from is we want to hear from you all, what are some of the barriers that you're facing in your own organizations in your efforts to advance health equity? So we want to get a sense of, is it a lack of definition? Is it a lack of um, buy-in from various different individuals? Is it political divisiveness? So if you can start to kind of register, what is that one biggest barrier that you're facing? And um, that's also gonna help us as we launch into the discussion here today. So I'll give just another couple of seconds here to fill out the poll. Cool. 
And then Bernard, if you want to close the poll, we'll take a look. Uh, so it's pretty evenly divided, divided. and we, we kind of think about this in terms of level of readiness as well. But um, so some of them I'll just call out here is a lack of shared understanding. Um, the biggest one it looks like, or there's kind of a tie between the lack of funding and capacity, as well as practical tools and steps. Um, followed by political divisiveness, that is a, is a pretty big one and also um, challenges to implement. So hopefully we'll be talking, we'll be touching upon kind of all of these different issues as we talk, um, as we talk today. So with that next slide, this is just to kind of a transition slide to say, we're ready to dig into our conversation. So we're gonna turn off the PowerPoint and we're gonna dive into a discussion here with all of our panelists. Um, so again, Xeris, Kara and Wendelie, thank you so much for joining. So I wanna first um, just ask if each of you could kind of take a moment or two to introduce yourselves and your organizations and maybe share a few recent examples of how you have been working to address health inequities through law and policy in your work. And I will just let whoever is ready to, to jump on in. I can start. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon for those on the East Coast and good morning for those on the West Coast. And my name uh, is Kara James. I'm the president and CEO of Grant Makers and Health. And we are a philanthropy support organization that works with about 230 foundations, corporate giving programs, and others to achieve better health through better philanthropy. Uh, we do that by working with the foundations to help them learn um, about health issues, as well as programs that are effective in reaching communities and um, helping to improve outcomes, as well as to connect with each other and to policymakers and stakeholders and partners in the work, since we know that it, no one sector is going to be able to solve the challenges that we have and to grow in their efforts. Um, we have been focusing on health equities. Uh, the foundation of uh, grant makers and health, I should say, is almost 40 years old. Um, so next year is our 40th anniversary. And we have been focusing on health equity for almost as long as we've been in existence, uh, specifically with regards to what has been happening in last year, we, um, as many people have, expanded our focus and pivoted a lot to support um, the foundations as they have been expanding their work, some for whom this is new and others for whom have been at it for a long time. But we have been convening some of our CEOs to talk about health equity and some of the work that they're doing specifically around COVID vaccine distribution, dissemination, countering, outreach, education, and some of the messaging that is hitting uh, communities of color as well as how they can support some of the early on testing, outreach and education in the um, communities around some of the social determinants of health, food needs, transportation and others. Um, we also um, focus on rural health and so have a rural health leadership group that is also looking at some of the needs in rural communities. Um, and the um, we have a learning community that's focused on uh, healthy eating and sustainability of food programs in those communities. So. Those are a couple uh, in the very quick overview that I, I've done, but it is something we also are looking at maternal health issues and kind of weaving throughout a number of our programs. And really want to thank you, Sarah, for organizing this. And so happy to be here and be part of the conversation with my, my colleagues. Great. I guess I'll go next. Um, so currently I am, as you mentioned, a fellow, senior fellow at JPB, and I am with the Mailman School of Public Health. My work really is focusing around uh, continuing to draw attention to the ways in which COVID has been and continues to be in essence a, a master class in how the social determinants of health collide with uh, a vicious virus to really uh, rip the scab off, if you will, the inequities that underlie a lot of the health outcomes that we have. And so for one of the examples of the ways in which we, when I was at the health department here in New York City, addressed um, the underlying drivers was really looking at not just 
risk factors for why people became infected with the COVID virus, but how it was that we could specifically and immediately address those underlying drivers to, uh, as a way of reducing transmission. And so what that then translated into was, for example, providing free hotel rooms for people who had unstable housing, were living in overcrowded conditions, were living in multi-generational households, all of which were underlying risk factors for ongoing transmission for COVID-19. And so, you know, I think as our conversation uh, goes along, we can highlight other ways in which this pandemic has really been an opportunity for us to uh, bring more people into the fold, if you will, in terms of connecting the dots of what difference social determinants of health really do make on an everyday level for Americans across the country. Um, and hello everyone, I'm Wanda Limarte. I am the Director of Economic Justice for Community Change, which is a national organization um, that is in the business of building power for uh, directly impacted communities, predominantly advancing racial gender uh, and economic justice and equity across low-income communities of color um, and trying to really advance transformational change to improve the material conditions of our folks uh, with a path to uh, making sure that every family can thrive. Um, and I would say that in terms of our work and how it's uh, connected to this conversation we're having today, I think as community organizers for us, health inequity uh, is an intersectional thread that cuts across a lot of these core structural issues for families. Um, and we work directly with grassroots organizations that work with directly impacted folks. Uh, we work directly with individuals, um, building a sort of like a core base um, of caregivers, of childcare providers, parents, and just low income communities of color across the country uh, to be able to really uh, create a space for them to fight for themselves and to have the tools to be able to move uh, a just recovery. And so our work around health equity for the last uh, few years, our organization has been around for over 50 years, but our work sort of traces back to, you know, decades of organizing um, to make sure that low-income communities um, are cared for, working to pass and defend the Affordable Care Act, to expand Medicaid, uh, in states across the country to make sure that there's immigrant inclusion in all of our um, sort of public policies, uh, making sure that we have uh, systems that really sort of work uh, for our families. Um, and now our work is really sort of centered around a just recovery. And what does it look like, not just for immediate relief at the state, local and federal level, but even beyond that, how do we actually set the, the sort of clear foundation for a just recovery that works for everybody, um, that actually includes equity across the board, uh, and that makes sure that our families have a path um, to be able to actually come out of this um, uh, thriving. And I'm very, very excited to be part of this conversation today. Thanks, Quindley. I want to continue and just kind of keep the conversation going with you for a minute because I think what would be really helpful to hear is a little bit like maybe a specific example of how you've seen those power dynamics shift when you are including and centering community. And also um, maybe a word or two about how do we bring community voice into and connect with other systems, whether it be local government, state government, or in some cases, even bridging that connection to funders or the philanthropy world. So it's the other partners as you're talking about working across different sectors. Yeah. Well, you know, the, you know, I think the one of the things that I appreciate about the way that um, that you've laid out the sort of five fundamental drivers um, is that they're intertwined, right? Um, I think oftentimes in our sort of advocacy work, um, that's that's very well-meaning. Uh, it's missing a very key component, which is the people that are most impacted ought to be at the table. They ought to be part of every step of the process, not just at the end when they're getting the benefit, 
But at the very beginning, when the policy is being designed, when decisions are being made, when compromises are made, when decision makers are at the table trying to figure out what goes in, what goes out, and uh, and how those things are sort of determined, who gets included and who gets left out. Um, I think oftentimes those decisions are made without people that are directly impacted being in the room. Um, and I mean that at every level. I mean that in terms of like how we're actually designing federal policy that's moving more money into states and localities and uh, how sort of we're designing these big sort of universal sort of uh, focus um uh, uh, policies, but also have the implementation of them actually happen. And what we're seeing uh, in a lot of the state and local work that a lot of our partners have been doing uh, over the last year since the pandemic is that it actually makes a difference when folks can actually be in front of decision makers. And not just those that are elected, but the administrations at the state and local levels that actually implement um, how money is spent, how, you know, how they're going to actually provide real support, how hazard pay is distributed, who gets included, right? There, there's so many uh, aspects of, of the implementation and development of policy where our folks are incredibly brilliant. They understand this because they live this every day. Um, and just creating the right spaces where our folks can actually be part of the conversation and contribute in meaningful ways um, I think it's, you know, it's sort of like the core sort of tenet, I think, of having real civic participation and engagement with the directly impacted folks in the process. That's helpful. So, um, Dr. Barbara, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of pick on you next because I also heard you say this in a different in a different venue, which was engaging community. And so from the perspective of local government, um, I, you know, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on that. And also just where do you see local government doing good and including some of those structural drivers? And like, what are some of the opportunities, too, that COVID has really lifted up? Thank you for that. You know, I, I, let me start off by saying that I think that um, the times that we're living in demonstrate that community inclusion has never been so important, right? Having, as Wendy Lee mentioned, having community at the table is critical in order for us to put COVID behind us in a way that's just and equitable. right? We, we're only as healthy as our most challenged community. And unless we fully understand what the issues are in different communities that keep people from being able to um, adhere to recommendations that keep communities uh, unable from fully participating, then, then we all lose. So for example, in New York City, we uh, stood up a community advisory board early on, especially when we knew that black and brown people were being disproportionately affected by COVID so that we could uh, engage higher numbers of trusted messengers to get the message out in any way and every way possible to ensure that we were getting real time feedback about what was working with our response and what was not working and where it was that we needed more community partners to have more resources from the city so that they could meet their community's needs. I think the, the other thing that I will say is that that work then should translate hopefully into more communities being engaged in conversations that we're currently having around, for example, vaccine hesitancy. And so the importance of, of having communities at the table is that this is a way to engage communities from typically think about in terms of community engagement, which is getting the message out, getting people, you know, engaged in processes all the way through to the power that communities have in engaging their members, their constituencies, creating bridges across communities that government could never do in a short amount of time like we have in COVID, right? I think what we have learned is that, especially when we think about vaccine hesitancy, the underlying issue here is trust and trust doesn't develop overnight. And the importance of having true meaningful community partnerships is that 
government then leans on community for community to lead. And that takes, I think, um, evolved leaders to understand that having community at the table doesn't mean giving up power. It actually means building more power for everyone. Yeah, and I want to come back to that because there, there are, there were some questions um, that the audience submitted in advance, and some of those questions were, "What if we don't have the leadership?" Right, and we saw that in some of the poll too, where people are saying, "What happens when we don't have those evolved leaders?" Or maybe they're just not on the the same page yet, or there's not a readiness there. So, I will, I will um, put that in in your feed, Axiris and and, and Windley, and also I'd love to hear from from Dr. James because you were in, at CMS, you know, during an, an unfriendly administration, if you will. And so you kind of bring that perspective, but I'd also like to hear from you in terms of where do you see funders, you know, plugging into some of these opportunities. So Kara, if I, I'll give you the, the floor here and then we can circle back to Wendell and X series too, to hear more about this, like how do you make change to potentially from the middle? Yeah, so thank you. And I think I, well, let me say on making change from wherever you are, change takes time. Um, and it's not something that happens overnight. And when I think about even in my experiences at CMS, when I first started, it was a new office. So, you know, Medicare and Medicaid have been around for 50 years and minority health was not a focus of that until the passage of the Affordable Care Act. So starting in that and even in a quote unquote friendly administration, there are challenges. And so the approach that I took and moving forward with the work is one of you know, community-based participatory research model, meeting people where they are. So for some people, um, you know, I honestly, I never really said racism at CMS, not because I didn't think that that was a problem or that it existed, but because that wasn't necessarily going to be helpful in moving the conversation forward. So I think, you know, approaching people where they are, understanding that um, organizations, governments, foundations, anything is on, they're on continuums. So for some, again, you know, we think about foundations like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who've been talking about culture of health and health equity for, for years and years, and others who are newer to the game, you have to meet people where they are. Same with community, you meet them where they are and engage them in a level that makes the most sense. We don't talk down to people, we approach them with cultural humility, we engage with them and understanding that everybody has something to learn from each other. So I think those are just some of the things that I would think about. And, um, you know, I had a, a professor who, from a communication standpoint said, you have to say things seven times, seven different ways in order for people to hear it. And it's the same thing with this work. You have to continue with the message, bring the information, bring the data, bring the stories so that people do hear it, but present it in a way that um, allows them to receive it where they are. Um, so that would be one. I think in terms of where we have seen specifically health funders over this past year, the conversations around power sharing are very much happening. Understanding that there needs to be engagement with community, even in just identifying the problems, um, that those are you know, co-creating those problems as well as the solutions in that engagement. And again, foundations are on a continuum. There are some that are embracing this and really trying to engage and others who are still struggling with that and coming at that model of, of here's what's best for you and here's what we're gonna give you the money to do. I think the other thing that we've seen foundations really understand is that, um, you know, ideally we know that the best way to give the grants is to give it an unrestricted funding to allow the community and the organizations to meet those needs. And we saw some of that in, in pivoting where foundations relaxed restrictions on the dollars required, less reporting allowed for general operating funds to be used so that people could quickly get those resources where they were most needed. I think the question that a lot of people have is, is that going to last as we move forward? Um, because there have been some successes with that, uh, but it also is hard when you're trying to show the impact of what you did. If it's, I gave general operating funds to you know an organization to do X, Y, and Z. I think the other thing that I would say, and I saw in some of the chat as people are saying sort of the large national funders, not necessarily getting the money into the community, we are seeing some of the, the large funders who are thinking about how do they build stronger relationships in those local areas to be able to reach in because it's not 
necessarily that they don't want to, but they don't necessarily have those ties into community to be able to fund in a way that can be effective. And so they are thinking about how do they build that um, sort of resource and engagement to be able to, to kind of get what, what is needed there. Um, so let me stop there because I could keep going, but I think those are some of the things that we are seeing and how we think about an approach, but it is again, a journey that everyone is on in a different place on that journey. So, Wendy Lee or Series, do you want to chime in on, on on the comment or the the idea of you know how do we um, how can we be more thoughtful in engaging community? Kind of what are some of the steps or tools? Because I I, I mean, Carrie, you're right. There is no one size fits all model, right? For this, you have to really assess where people are at, and and part of that is like understanding some of the data, and not just about the the, the numbers, but part of it is also like looking at the patterns of discrimination across the past and really understanding what has driven us to where we are today. Who are the fundamental communities who are there? But a lot of it is trust and relationship building and sort of, you know, taking some small steps in order to start to make some of those big steps. Um, I've done some work in California where, you know, for 10 years we spent time working together to then finally put forth a really proactive agenda. And but it took time and it took working together and it took just really them trusting us as the intermediary advocates and, and being able to understand the process as well. Um, and then being able to feel really comfortable and confident to be able to engage in that process. So again, Oxiri Sir Windley, I don't know if you want to chime in with any kind of additional thoughts or perspectives around the community engagement side. Yeah, yeah you know, sorry, Wendley, I'll, I'll go after you. <laughs> um, so, I mean, uh, this, uh, this concept of power sharing that's uh, that's been named in the chat is interesting. We call it co-governance. Um, and at the core of it is this belief that uh, community needs to be part of the governing um, equation <laughs> um, when it comes to trying to figure out uh, how, our, how our government uh, serves its people. And um, I think that uh, there are there are different ways that you know there are different sort of experiments that are going around uh, across the country. I think most of the successful ones are really uh, start at the local level um, because of the local level. I think presents a lot of opportunities, and we often talk about sort of local and state sort of policy fights this way. But I also think it applies to some of these governing models. Um, that are that pop up. You know, I also live in in New York. I'm from the Bronx, um, and there are many sort of examples of how, whether it is through participatory budgeting or uh, a lot of the sort of like broad uh, ways in which um, different local elected officials are trying to think about civic engagement, not just of sort of like active citizen voters but of broader community folks that would often be left out of a process collectively to be able to contribute to uh, sort of determining priorities for their own communities. Um, and there's, you know, there's lots of ways in which uh, that work needs to happen. Um, I also like one of the comments that it's happened that, that I saw sort of like this sort of into the, the sort of uh, play between uh, are folks, are folks renters in their democracy or are they actually owners in it? Um, and I think that that is that is a core sort of a core tension that as organizers we wrestle with um, often, which is are we trying to just sort of come in at key moments for key interventions, or are we actually trying to be uh, here long term? Um, and we have a lot of funders uh, that are listening. I think we often tend to approach um, the way that we support uh, local organizations from this sort of like very intersectional inter in transactional way that often doesn't lead room for folks to be able to build long-term sustained power that actually allows for community to be a real power broker in 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 the in the dynamics um, and i think that you know this is obviously a 501c3 conversation but i think that the that the approach so actually building long-term political power that allows for community to really be at the decision-making table and be able to co-govern um, and sort of keep pushing uh, from the inside and the outside uh, of government 
um, is a, it requires a comprehensive approach. That means not just policy development and outside pressure, but also being able to actually put people that look like us that are coming from our communities in those positions of power. Um, and 501c3 doesn't always allow us all the sort of bandwidth to be able to do that. But I think it is a key sort of, um, uh, it's a key sort of way in which we're gonna be able to advance not just um, the sort of like immediate wins, but like the long-term narrative shift that is needed for us to be able to even, you know, get to more of the proactive um, proactive fights that we're trying to, to take on over the long term. So actually, I'll, it, I'm glad that I'm going after Wendy Lee because I think it builds both on what she mentioned and what Kara raised. And I'm going to meld, you know, sort of influencing the trajectory of organizations from the middle and how we do that with um, organizations. So from my perspective, you know, whether you're in the middle of an organization or at the top of an organization or on the outside of an organization, an advocate trying to influence internally, I think the dynamics tend to be somewhat similar, right? Because it's looking for opportunities and it's, it's keeping in perspective that this is a long game, right? And so that the types of individuals who are, I think, most successful at influencing agendas are those that can toggle between short-term wins and long-term objectives, as well as realizing that you don't have to be in charge to be leading a charge, right? So that if someone is perhaps at the middle of an organization, there's a lot of um, flexibility, a lot of power that can be gained from that. And, you know, waiting for the opportunity, perhaps when a more open leader comes in to then have your issue rise to the top. Or if a leader comes in that's not open to, to leverage the power of the outside advocates to then put pressure on that leader. And so, you know, I think in terms of the five drivers that we are talking about that lead to health and equity and how we can influence it from both a, a power sharing or a co-governance perspective. I think that the opportunities are really ripe for the taking and that COVID presents a really urgent, um, let's say, palette for us to really start working on. And if I could just build off of something Oxidia said, I, I really love the sort of being able of wherever you are to sort of have that influence because the top, the top changes probably more than what's happening in the middle. And the middle are some of those really strong relationships. And so when you think about, you know, government, the career staff are there regardless of who's in charge at the top. They're the ones also who really know the ins and outs of those programs in ways that can, you know, make changes that and and can do that. And so I would say that, you know, when I people sometimes are like, I can't believe you stayed, we were still able to do stuff. And we worked primarily with our career colleagues to continue moving things forward. So you may not have seen a press release about it the way you would have it prior, but it didn't mean it didn't happen. And so I would say that I would encourage people to think about those relationships and, and forging those, because those will also last a little bit longer than the political wins. I think there's, there's some really key um, kind of nuances or really key information that you know, you're sharing with folks because, and, and I think that there are, there's other, there's a lot of tools out there that you can use within those different, with wherever you are within your structure. Um, but I think a big part of it is like the strategy and the listening and like um, Oxiris is saying sort of the long game, like it's not gonna, we're not gonna flip switches. It's gonna take time and building those relationships and also really understanding sort of what are the different tools that you have at your disposal or the different strategies that you can use to build those relationships and then slowly over time um, start to see those shifts so that when that person and who's in power and who's ready to take on those issues is you you're you're ready to you know to partner with them 
Um, I want to touch upon sort of two, we're coming, we're coming close to the hour, so I just want to be conscious of time. We did have quite a few questions about working in rural communities. Um, and so I'd like to, to tee up, I think, Kara, you in particular, you've worked on a rural um, health strategy, but I'm, I'm happy to hear from others as well. But are there particular um, differences, nuances, or strategies that we should be thinking about when really trying to build some tolerance and some readiness to move health equity issues forward in a, in a rural community that might be different from working in an urban community? Yeah, so I think for the most part, and one of the things that I wrote about um, in October is that you know, really rural advocates and health advocates advocates, health equity advocates really should think about working together because the problems are very similar. The challenges of getting your voice heard, getting a seat at the table when decisions are being made are very similar. I think what is um, a little different in some of those is we think about, you know, from a racial equity standpoint, that's not necessarily on the minds of many of those in rural communities, in part because it's less diverse than urban areas. That doesn't mean it's not diverse, just less diverse. So when we look at things like rural hospital closures, they have disproportionately affected rural communities of color. But some of the challenges around broadband, um, you know, transportation needs, and one that often surprises people given where most of our food is grown in the country is that there's food insecurity in many rural communities. And so I think there's a lot of commonality that how people can kind of come together in that shared experience, the things that people value and care about, community, education, family, work, um, those are similar issues. And so I think there's a lot there. I think one of the other pieces that sometimes, um, and I don't think it's any different necessarily than some urban communities, is, is there can be a distrust of outsiders. Um, and so that sort of approach and how you approach people again with that cultural humility, humility and um, one of the things that Wendell Lee was talking about, you know, sustained effort and attention. So you're not just popping in, swooping in, doing one thing and leaving, but um, building those relationships over time. And it takes time to do this work. Um, and I think one of the things we've had a challenge with in the pandemic is we're trying to build trust when we haven't really engaged in the middle of a, a pandemic. Um, and so that's something that we want to build that in, rate, in normal times um, so that when there's an emergency, we can come together. But I think there are so many commonalities, but you do have some differences in terms of geography, terrain, access, the broadband pieces. Um, but again, even those are somewhat common because when you look at urban households who have individuals with less than high school education, they're less likely to have an internet. Doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to get it per se, but um, it's still an issue. So those are, I think, a lot of commonalities that are there. Um, sir, sir, would, would just... Yeah, no, I was, uh, ditto uh, to all of that. I think that that's all, that's all right on. I think um, a lot of these communities, uh, rural communities have been chronically, historically disinvested, just uh, have a lot of uh, trust issues with government. Um, and so I think that, you know, to all the challenges around, you know, public hospital closures to childcare deserts to food insecurity, like all of those things, I think, contribute to um, what I think is sort of like a challenge that we've identified and sort of like our organizing movement in general around how do we uh, start to really engage deeply in rural communities where there is a lot of um, what I would say is like a, a desert in terms of organizing infrastructure as well. Um, and how do we start to address um, those things? I would say that despite all the challenges and uh, you know a lot of what you were saying, uh, Kara, about sort of like access to internet and, and technology and, um, and all those things are real. And since COVID, one of the things that we've been able to do because of digital organizing where we haven't had reach in terms of physical organizing in the past, sort of like in-person organizing in the past is actually being able, again, how do you meet people where they're at? They're online. <laughs> and so uh, I think there are some really interesting uh, sort of like uh, uh, sort of uh, opportunities um, that we've been able to identify. I think the issues of unemployment, of rental access, of, of, uh, of healthcare and food, but also 
even more increasingly now vaccine distribution are issues um, that are really resonating in rural communities. And I think we have an opportunity, um, not just because of sort of like the struggle of, um, of the pandemic, but also what might be possible in a just recovery sort of um, moment to be able to really capitalize on that shared experience that we're all <laughs> feeling around COVID um, and be able to actually engage folks a lot more meaningfully in all communities across the country, rural and urban alike, uh, to be able to be part of the fight. And one last thing I would just say, there is a history of that working together in some respects. And um, I was watching uh, some documentaries on the civil rights movement, and there was a group that worked in Appalachia to help some of those individuals in Kentucky learn how to advocate in their own community, applying a lot of the civil rights techniques that were taught in some of the sit-ins and other areas to engage in that. So there is a history of working together in similarity, and I think building back on that to lift up where there are those commonalities to increase that voice, increase the power, ability to make that change and the engagement in the governance process, I think really would help all of us. I want to um, shift a little bit, kind of you, um, Kara and Wendley both, you started to talk a little bit about trust and, and that um, kind of building trust among organizations and also um, kind of bringing in the, the theme of power sharing. And that um, even when there's like a lack of, you know, sometimes there's a lack of trust between communities and government um, because the community maybe doesn't trust the government per se. But I think there's also a tension with government or, or, or other folks um, with the idea of like sharing power with community. And there's a real tension there. Um, and so I wonder if we, if you could speak, any of you could speak a little bit to, um, and I think Wendell, you had started to share a little bit about like, it works so much better when you are sharing power with, with community. But I think there, there's, so I'm, I'm just hearing in some of the questions that are coming up too, it's like, how do we dispel any myths out there that sharing power is going to, um, you know, result in more distrust or, or how do we kind of get over that, that, that that mistrust that might be there around sharing some of that power. Just to throw a light one out there for you all. Uh, you know, let me start. As, as someone who ran the largest health department in the country, um, I think it starts with having leaders that come in with humility, you know, who are not afraid to say, we don't have all the answers. We don't have all of the tools. We know that the best and most creative ideas come from community. We're not interested in being an extractive entity in our community. Let's work together so that whatever we collectively decide is needed is done in a way that has sustainability, right? Because I think Cara mentioned it earlier, leaders come and go. And the best way from my perspective that we can assure sustainability of how we influence, for example, the built environment, power dynamics, is to ensure that there's community ownership. And the way that we do that is by having community have Act, equal access to decision making, right? They're invested. This is what they need. This is what they want. This is what I want. And so I, I think that's from, from my perspective, the way that I would go about it. Do you want to go, Kara? I was going to, I saw you come off mute, so I was going to let you go and then I'll follow up. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, I guess I'll give just a brief example of, of how I've seen this in action. And so for a few years, we've been working with this organization called Parent Voices Oakland in California. And um, in 2018, uh, the Board uh, of Supervisors was had a, on the ballot an initiative to uh, create something uh, close to a universal child care system. And, um, and they weren't able to win it, 
Um, it was a, a huge struggle with community to have the community uh, sort of be part of the process, developing the strategy from developing the policy itself to the field plan to the implementation of that. And they lost that like 0.2%. They needed two thirds and they didn't get it. And in 2019, the community decided we're going to take the lead this time. So this time, you board of supervisors follow the community's lead and will run an even bigger <laughs> initiative that will include both child care and also funding for the pediatric sort of hospital uh, in the region. So they sort of decided to run this initiative that won in March of last year uh, that will generate $150 million a year uh, over 10 years for both child care and childhood um, health uh, access. And there's, there's just so much to learn about that entire experience. We have a case study that I'm happy to share, but there is a huge difference when community is at the table and community is allowed to lead and be innovative and implement the kinds of strategies that it will actually take, not just to win the stuff, but now they have an actual uh, stake, right? Community is actually at the table in terms of how this thing is going to be implemented. And we'll see what happens, but I, you know, the, the, the possibilities are limitless, right? Because when you have community that are actually experiencing this thing every day, that I get to actually like see how it works and how it doesn't and innovate uh, in the moment to be able to actually adjust so that the thing actually works better for communities um, is critical. Uh, and we need more examples of that. We need more examples across the country where community is leading in partnership with government to be able to actually advance policies that are going to have a real impact in communities' lives. That is a fabulous example. Sorry, go ahead, Kara. I just wanted to say, and um, I'm seeing it in the chat too, that people like that really concreteness of like, here's an example of how you see, and and that that failure doesn't mean you can't like not. It's not failure, right? But like winning, if you don't win something, it doesn't mean you like have to go away. It means okay, what did we need to? What do we need to do differently next time in order to move this the same process forward? So sorry, go ahead, Kara. No, I'm going to leave it at that. That was an excellent example. And I think very well said. And Agreed. I think, and I'll, I'll also just raise too, that I think it goes back to, you know, Wendell, your, your observation about um, what we can and can't fund, you know, with it, within the nonprofit structure, right? Like when you get dollars and how dollars are able to be used. And, and I think, you know, Karen, not to put you on the spot, but I do think that there's like a, um, there's a sort of traditional kind of safe way that philanthropy has chosen to, 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 to work. I think in some ways government as well too. And so how do we even push our sectors, right? To be thinking beyond. And I, and I do feel like COVID is one of those moments where it's like, okay, what we've been doing isn't working. How do we start to shift a little bit? And I think to your point, Wendelie, about how do we allow people to be able to get in, engaged in policy change? How do we allow people to be able to have those seats at the table? How do we build capacity where it's not just about, you know, vaccine distribution is important. We want to get those shots in people's arms, but but the, the, the programs, the day-to-day -day programs that we also need to be looking at what are the structural barriers and the shifts that need to happen Happen and and that there's partnerships around the table who haven't always been given or this the the table hasn't been centered around them maybe they have a seat maybe they have a seat in the room but they don't don't have a seat at the table and the table certainly is not centered around them so one thing I would just add to the conversation and I think about you know again my lens has been the world of health equity for years and when we think about what's been successful, what hasn't been successful. I think there are things that we in the health equity field could do better. And I think when we're having the conversation around the co-creation, collaboration, partnership, power sharing, whatever we wanna call this, that one of the things that everybody needs to recognize is you know, the world that we live in is our world and not necessarily the world that those at the, at the table with us live in. And so how do we um, you know, think about and approach people in a way that meets their needs as well. And, and what I mean by that specifically is one example in which there was a health system in uh, Pennsylvania who was working with their economic development fund to do housing to reduce 
the number of ER visits for people who were housing insecure because they were having lots of visits to the ER. And they showed that the program worked for reducing the visits to the ER, but that's not the outcome that the Economic Development Fund needs to show success for them. So how do we sort of become a little bit more educated in each other's outcomes, desires, and what people need to make the case for continued support so that we can build collective evaluation of things that are meaningful for all of us because we all have to respond to somebody in terms of was this a successful use of our resources. And so I I just say that to encourage all of us to become a little bit more educated across disciplinary areas of what it is that people are needing to be able to show success and building that in together as we work on all of these issues. I'm just going to build on that really briefly to say that this is also from a different perspective on health equity. This is a moment for us to look at all of the rules, regulations, and laws that have been suspended because of the COVID response and to really interrogate those and say, the world didn't fall apart because that rule regulation or law is no longer in effect. Do we really need it? How is it that it's contributing or not? To health equity so that in this process of rebuilding, you know, it, it's, it's an opportunity for us not to go back to the way things were and to try to tinker around the margins, but to really draw on the experience, the creativity of communities working with government to have a more just and equitable rebuild. So, um, Oxiris, if you can you say a little bit more too about because um, I want to pick up on this this kind of general theme about um, what did COVID sort of teach us? Where you know in this moment, and where do we? How do we think about as we're thinking about building back in recovery? What do we need to learn from this moment in order to do things differently going forward? So that that was a perfect point. And then, are there other sort of lessons learned that you've gathered from this pandemic that we need to be really centering as we move? forward? Wow, that's a great question. Um, So I'll give you two responses. One is a very sort of succinct response um, using methadone as an example, right? During COVID, New York City Health Department delivered methadone to people's homes, right? We suspect rules about you have to go to a clinic to get your methadone. You can't get refills. It's like, let's think about why is it that the rules, regulations, and laws around methadone, around medications that support people in recovery are the way that they are. And let's unpack that biased history to think about when we move, as we move forward, we do it in a more just and equitable way, right? Like the way we do methadone doesn't make sense. So that's one sort of example of a specific um, piece of, of law that's in place that that is disproportionately affecting certain parts of of our population and it's treating a a chronic illness different from another chronic illness, right? Why can't we prescribe methadone the way that we prescribe insulin? Enough on that. The second thing is, as we look towards the rebuild, it's important for us to think across disciplines, I think as, as both Wendelie and Cara have talked about, and the example that I use is one that looks at early child care centers, right? Early on in the, the, the shutdown, everything closed down. We were looking to then reopen the city. We did a survey to say, you know, what do early childhood centers need in order to reopen? And we got surveys from all over the city. And what I did was I asked my staff, I want you to map out where we got these responses from. Because it actually turns out that we didn't get responses from parts of New York City that are most economically disadvantaged. And the reason was because these early childhood centers are small centers typically run by women of color. And they didn't have the economic reserves to ride out even a short period of closure, right? So we didn't get responses because they had already gone under. And so in thinking about how is it that we support women of color entering or re-entering the small business market and how then supporting those women helps other women of color re-enter or stay in the workforce. And beyond that, how do these centers 
provide access for high quality early childhood education, which has been demonstrated to set children up for the greatest opportunities for success moving forward. We need our leaders to be thinking that way, right? Not to be thinking in a siloed manner, but to really look holistically at communities because, hey, folks, turns out that people live holistically, right? We need leaders that can model that. That's, um, that is so well put. And I just, the way that you've connected all of those issues, right, that everyday people live, but oftentimes as advocates or as government folks or whatever, we're thinking about these in silos. And that was just the, the brilliant way to like pull all of these things together and just demonstrate how they're interrelated. If you take one piece of the puzzle away, you know, it, it doesn't work. Um, so that was really, thank you for all of those examples. Wendelie and Kara, what, where, where are you thinking in terms of as we build back towards COVID recovery, what should we be really focused or what, what's the lesson learned here? Um, so I wanna ride the innovation train with Oxides. <laughs> I think uh, that is just key. I think the ways that we've seen innovation show up in policies and new revenue and um, in implementation, all the, the examples that, uh, that our cities gave around how implementation, how we can really be innovative and how we're implementing these policies is key. Um, I also think there is an opportunity uh, to think about not just the short term, but um, how are we sort of uh, creating a real thread between the short term needs and the long term possibilities um, that we have in front of us. Um, for, for to be able to really sort of advance health equity, racial equity across the board. Um, and then to this point around childcare, I'll just, you know, as someone who works in childcare, I just love, that was like music to my ears. Um, I think one of the things that, um, that the, the pandemic has done, um, which is I think really important, and Sarah, you and I were talking about this last time we were on the panel, I think, is how invisible work um, care work, essential work has become a lot more visible. And, um, and it has become visible in the way that we see it as like human beings because we're experiencing it every day. Uh, but it's also, I think, in terms of um, opportunities for uh, exactly that, how we're actually serving, serving this population or these populations because it's multiple constituencies <laughs> that fall under this category. Uh, have traditionally been underlooked, undervalued, and that is predominantly women. <laughs> because we know that care work, essential work, is predominantly the work of women and women of color. And we just have a responsibility, I think, in this point in time to, to make sure that they are centered in a just recovery. Um, and that the work of caregivers, of providers, of uh, nurses of the folks that care for us every day, um, who put their lives on the line and their families on the line every day, that we are also creating policies um, that are about making sure that they're cared for uh, by our society. Um, and so I'll just add, I'll just add that to the conversation because I think that there's just, there's just so much, uh, there's so much work that we need to do to make sure that that happens uh, over the long term. Okay, so I'm going to end, I'm going to try and end on a positive note, but I'm also going to end on, on a thing, couple of things we haven't touched on. And when I think about the lessons that are, we should be learning from this, um, one is that when whatever happens next, we should not be surprised that communities of color, low-income communities are disproportionately affected across the board by whatever. I'm, I think the the surprise that people continue to have at the fact that people are being disproportionately affected in job loss, housing, access to PPP, um, you know, whatever the case may be, not getting that, that just really is no longer acceptable. I mean, it just, we have those five drivers that you talk about, the structural discrimination, income inequality, disparities and opportunity, those play out in every facet of our life. And when we have an example of whatever the issue is, we need to be thinking about that and recognizing that even without the data, which is the second thing I'm going to talk about, that we don't have 
we should not be surprised to see the disproportionate impact in these communities and need to be thinking about those before and and how we build supports and systems to be able to help people get what they need. Um, the data is the second thing. It's, it's not okay anymore that we don't know what's happening. We need to build data systems to be able to track this and to be able to lift that up because quite frankly, that's how people respond to some of it. If you can't quantify the problems then people don't you know, advocate and release the resources that are needed to address these things. And um, the fact that it was four months before we could get data on race and ethnicity to see who was getting tested is, is not acceptable. And the fact that we started vaccinating and didn't have data in so many places and still don't have data in so many places really just has become unacceptable. Um, and there are real data challenges. So when we talk about infrastructure needs, we need to be thinking about how do we build infrastructure for data to understand our problems and monitor our progress. Um, the other thing that the pandemic has lifted up, which I'm hoping we're gonna talk more about, um, is our workforce in, again, everything, childcare, caregivers, healthcare. We have workforce shortages in certain communities. We have workforce needs, particularly when we talk about rural communities and other underserved. We have not really focused on what does it mean to have a sustainable workforce for the future. And I would say even before the pandemic with the automation and opioid overdoses that we were seeing and the deaths of despair, people need to be able to provide um, sustainable livelihood for themselves and their families and jobs are an important part of that. And we need to think about what are our workforce needs for the future and how do we get people trained appropriately to be able to meet those needs and to have a life um, because that is, that is really important. And the last thing that I will say um, is the, you know, short and long-term as needs as we're looking forward, we still don't know um, what the mental health fallout of this is going to be, but we do know we're not prepared to meet those needs because we've had a mental health system that has been challenged already before the pandemic. And we should not be surprised because we already know communities of color are less likely to get access to mental health services. When you look at the statistics of those who would qualify for any mental illness compared to those who are actually receiving treatments, communities of color are significantly less likely. So can we try to build a plan that addresses some of those barriers on the front end so that we're not sitting a year and a half later saying, ha, huh, look at that. They didn't get the services that they need. Um, and the last thing I would say is coming out of the recession of 2009, we know that the recovery is not going to be equitable. So I think that it's important for us to think about how do we make sure that we don't pull the rug out from under some of our communities just because the national numbers say that we're back. Um, so make sure that those supports give people the time and the resources they need to get their families back up because it takes longer in a lot of these communities that have been hard hit to get back to normal. And for some, it may not be quote unquote normal. Well, I'd like to add to this conversation, just um, a moderator's prerogative here for a minute, but just um, I want to add a couple of things that I think we've learned in this process as well, because Change Lab has had an opportunity to take some technical assistance questions from different organizations around the country, a lot of them legally related. And so I think one of the things that really came to bear in this was like, also how unprepared we were around what are the legal authorities and what are the legal responses? Um, you know, how do we think about civil rights, you know, in the context of civil rights, how do we, how are we responding in a way that's not going to um, trigger those civil rights violations? Or how do we think about this in a way to utilize the protections that are on the books to really help some of the, the communities that we're, we're thinking about and talking about? Um, and it did not help necessarily that we had a federal legislation that what or a federal administration that wasn't kind to that but I mean I think it was also just you know how do we how do we kind of think about the role of law but it, I also wanted to raise that there was also a lot of attention paid to sort of the federal level responses and there were some very innovative local approaches um, and I think it was raised earlier that oftentimes I think Wendelie you mentioned that like local is oftentimes where it's at right there's a lot of innovation that's happening there's more flexibility, there's more opportunity to bring community into the table. And, um, and I think it, it is really helpful as we're building back to really understand how do we leverage 
the coordination between local, state, and federal, because not everybody's on the same page. And in fact, we've seen a bit of divisiveness happening even more so after this past election. And so just really thinking about how do we, how can we promote? I mean, Kara, you wrote in a recent blog about civility. How do we kind of bring civility back and how do we think about this from a collective approach? And then the last point that I would make is just on our infrastructure. Um, and we've talked a lot about infrastructure today. And I think really also recognizing just the importance that our local infrastructure has, whether it's community-based organizations who are serving those communities who didn't have access to or weren't able to um, get some of those federal or state funds, but that there, there, was, there is an infrastructure of community-based organizations who are serving some of these most vulnerable populations and how do we bring them into the fold in this next time around and actually start to think of them as an extension of our government infrastructure or even as our funding infrastructure and that to really leverage and, and rally around those folks as well. So we're coming close to time and I, um, I want to thank you all so much. I want to give you a chance to also um, share any closing comments or thoughts that you have. If, if you don't necessarily have closing thoughts at this moment, I'd be curious to hear too kind of just what gives you hope in this time? Like what are you most kind of looking forward to or what are the opportunities that you're really hoping that we can leverage in this, in this as we look towards the future? So I'll start and, and I'll say that what gives me hope is actually something that when the lead uh, alluded to and it's this um, shared experiences. I think that the way in which COVID has destabilized. Oh, we can't hear you. Oh, serious. oh sorry. That's okay. Ne better now? Okay, um, has um, the way that people have been destabilized, not only here in the US, but across the world, I think from my perspective seems to have opened a lot of hearts and minds to how is it that we build a better world where being interdependent isn't seen as a weakness, but rather as a strength. And how, do, how is it that we take care of one another that goes beyond our physical health, but that goes to our mental and spiritual health as well. So even though um, there are a lot of co-occurring crises right now, I'm very hopeful for what lies ahead. And I'll build on that. I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful about a couple of things. One, I actually am hopeful that so many people are um, now sort of awakened to the inequities that we have. And so many organizations, entities across the board are talking about this in a way that we have not seen in, in decades, really. And I think that they commitment to make change happen um, across all sectors. I, I mean, I'm just looking at the business sector and what they're doing and continuing to build on that. You know, everybody is kind of talking about this. So I think it's a great moment. The other thing that I'm actually really hopeful for coming back to, you know, sort of where we started in some of the community conversations is to some extent, the fact that we've all been home, we have actually built stronger community because we now know our neighbors in a way that we didn't before. Um, so I will just say from my own neighbors, they kind of joke, they didn't think anybody lived here because of the hours that I kept um, from work. But you know that also is seeds that can help to build power in communities and to make change and address these issues. And I'm hoping that even as people start to go back to the office or to school and everything, that we continue those connections and build to improve on our community. So I'm, I'm hopeful about those two things. And I would say the third thing is just that the innovation that we've talked about, the creativity, how people have responded and come together to help people out continues to show that we are willing to help address these issues. And I just, um, those are some things that give me hope. Yeah, ditto. Um, <laughs> uh, across uh, both of what's been, uh, what Oxides and Gara have shared, I think um, the, the creativity and the innovation and the sort of sense of collective, like, 
uh, troubleshooting that I've seen across the board, right? Like that is not one sort of constituents problem, but it's all of our problem. Like there's, there's sort of like lots of examples that I've seen over the last year of like just people showing up in solidarity in different ways that, um, that are really sort of uh, validating. And I think that point to uh, what it's possible, um, how we might actually how the new normal after the pandemic might be better than the normal before, right? Like there's, there's just so much, I think that's pointing to what might be, what might be possible after that might be really empowering for our communities. Um, and that can, can build sort of d- these deeper sort of uh, pockets of connection and interconnectedness and, um, and all of that, like, you know, the sort of like, the possibility for humans, <laughs> for a human society afterwards. Um, I think there's just so much that uh, that's there. And then on the sort of equity front, uh, it also feels like, right, right? Like if we're a society where we're, we're seeing each other struggle differently as a shared experience, uh, that I as an organizer, I am like a hopeless sort of like, uh, you know, romantic in the sense that like that I think sets, it's like all the right ingredients, right? To be able to actually advance like proper <laughs> equitable uh, uh, policies in our society. Because if we're no longer seeing each other as others, but actually seeing each other in a shared struggle and experience, that can we also see each other in a shared vision for our future, right? Like, is it possible? Like all of those things just give me hope. <laughs> um, and the creativity that I've seen in terms of how people are coming together, organizing each other, educating one another, like building with each other to all the things that folks have shared, just I think the, all the all the sort of all the right ingredients are there. I think it's up to us now to figure out what is the sort of magical sauce that's gonna bring it all together. That was really beautiful. I want to thank you all so, so much for spending time with us today and sharing your experiences and, and really for sharing, for, le- for ending this on a really positive and optimistic note. I know that we have a lot of work in front of us, but I think with leaders like you all, um, we can absolutely achieve a lot in this time. And we have some, some real big challenges in front of us, but I think, again, leveraging um, the strengths that of our of our connection and of our community and really centering community, I think we will be, be very successful. I'm going to ask Bernard to bring us back to the slideshow just for a really quick quick slide, um, and you can go ahead and advance it to the last slide because we've we've run out of time here. Um, what I want to just say is that we really want to stay connected with you all, and so here's the contact information for our um, colleagues here today. And please go to Change Lab Solutions website if. You you're interested in more definitions, if you're interested in looking at the blueprint for change makers, which has all of our the, the five fundamental drivers outlined, it has much more rich information and frameworks, principles to build upon today. Um, and we really look forward to staying in touch with you. I want to also just um, remind folks that our next webinar will be March 30th at 1030 a.m. Pacific time. And that will be focused on employment. So again, we'll fold in these five drivers, but we'll be doing a deep dive on employment and we'll be looking at laws and policies that affect workers and how oftentimes or sometimes inequitable enforcement that is intended to protect workers can actually exacerbate inequities and disparities. So registration will be opening up next week. And again, we encourage you to visit Change Lab Solutions, our website, changelabsolutions.org for more information. Um, Thank you all again. Thank you to the panelists for the Change Lab staff and for all of the audience members for your very interactive chat and your very um, important and thought-provoking questions. Thanks to everyone. Please be safe. We'll see you soon.